So I want to say thank you all here with Joan for inviting me into your homes and your space as a southerner. I know how important that is when you enter into the dwelling of someone else, your neighbor. I especially want to thank Mr. Bird and his team. Um, and I also want to thank you all for your due diligence and the steps that it took in order for me to be here. Um, that's actually a part of who I am and what I believe in. And you have to earn everything. And I think I have been in today earned the right to have some of these conversations today. So when we hear these terms, we hear a lot of things that we're talking about. We're talking about implicit bias. We're going to put that on the background a little bit. I want to expand a little bit about my journey. Um, the proud public school education is one that allows one to have both of those conversations, right? So when we're talking two conversations, we're talking an informal education and a formal education. We all sit in classrooms with teachers that have a level of expertise, administrators, coaches, guidance counselors, custodial staff. But there's something that I am very fortunate of that I want to take full advantage of is as a criminologist, I'm a social scientist, and every day when I walk outside, that is my lab. That is an organic lab that I cannot control. I am not a STEM, I'm not a physicist, I'm not a chemist. That organic lab that we have to interact with each other based on the way we've been cultivated into society is so fortunate to get so many informal educational opportunities to learn from. What I'm gonna bring you today is some of those conversations, some of those talking points that I hope you meet with today, that you see that lab in a different lens based on your individual bringing, upbringing, that grandmama, granddaddy, great grandmama, auntie, boo-boo, Willie, mm -hmm. <laughs> that gave us, that created the foundation of morality or what's good and what's bad, that may not be applicable today in society. I'm gonna challenge you to think about some of those lessons, some of those conversations that they had with you I want you to do a self-reflection today to see how well they prepared you to create a different way of thinking, a different way of being. Because we're going to appreciate how much strength we have in difference. We are in a country that categorizes everything. I mean everything. Race, class, gender, socioeconomic status, uh, zip codes, and everything has a backstory to it. It always amazes me when we look at our Census Bureau and we look at the impact and all that information that is grounded in five numbers. Those five numbers are the zip codes where you live right now. And you can look at those zip codes and you can see the public education system. You can see unemployment rates. You can see poverty or lack thereof. You can see how much funds your local government are investing in creating, and I mean create some of the barriers that we've been talking about in this country for centuries. I cannot apologize for what we have organized in a structured way to create inequality. As a social scientist, just like a medical doctor, it's my responsibility to diagnose structural inequality and go back into my lab come up with a diagnosis and prescribe some medicine that's going to change what we've been discussing forever. I can't apologize that we continue to talk about mass incarceration. I can't apologize that we have strained relationships between some communities and law enforcement. I can't apologize that the first four minutes of every 30-minute news segment that you sit down and watch, that we continue to perpetuate fear by putting the worst information out and a country that can choose to highlight accurate. See, unconsciously, what we've done is we've gotten very comfortable being okay to struggle with love. That most of us are mothers, wives, fathers, partners, <coughs> financial advisors, criminologists, volunteers. And we get this thing called a clock that we get structured into doing our own lifestyles, right? We get to doing our own lifestyles, and these things that happen, they're, they're kind of like, you know, moments in time that we almost expect these issues to be a part of our normal day. As a critical criminologist, I examine 
I examine systems, and I'm very critical about systems, and I started off looking at our present system, and a great philosopher said, you can tell the state of a nation by how many people we incarcerate. We are the number one incarcerated nation in the world. And we all know from a population perspective, 100,000 per capita is how we always quantify people. We aren't even close to having the most violent, physical violence in the world. So that tells me that there's something going on, there's a systemic issue that we are struggling with in this nation on why we choose punitive measures over rehabilitation measures or that prevention measure. Do y'all realize that we put 70% of our federal funds in responding to issues? 20% goes into intervention. And guess what goes into prevention? You know, constantly, that we aren't going to have these conversations, right? Why do you think only 10% goes into prevention? And you can't measure it. You can't measure what didn't happen. For some reason, the National Enquirer, it says more papers than the New York Times. We're cultivated to enjoy some of the struggle, right? We're cultivated to pre appreciate someone else's downfall. I know it's tough to hear, but we do. We're commodities, and we make a whole lot of money off people. We're in the justice system, public education, healthcare, higher education. I'm a graduate of Walker College. I have conversations all the time at Walker College, so I go back, I consult. We're trying to create different ways of thinking. We want to work with more minorities that just don't play football. Walker College is the only one. It's a microcosm of the world of society. What does Edward Jones say? I had an opportunity to do some research before I got here, and I love this conversation around the Wings program, right? The fact that you have not only had the conversation and recognized that there's a deficit with women participating and being financial advisors, you put money where your mouth is. I love the initiative. I love the initiative around the bridge program. That tells me that consciously people are making an effort to create a more harmonious society. Why is that important? Do you realize that 85% of the people that get incarcerated in this nation are coming home one day? I mean, it's easy to do the political identity from a conservative ideology to a liberal to a Democrat. Those are nice terms, but at the end of the day, Humanity and society have to recognize that we can't keep locking everybody up. If you have a conversation around public school education, and I'm not sure how many of you all remember the zero tolerance policy that we initiated in response to the school shootings in the early 90s. It's a great idea. <coughs> I want to protect our babies, don't we? What happens to that policy when it comes to implementation? Somehow or another, we lose some of our high standards whenever we're trying to protect our babies when we're implementing policies on the ground. So that zero tolerance policy was a non-violent approach to loving our babies and protecting them. But what happened is we created this conversation around the school to prison pipeline. Is that instead of our teachers, administrators, coaches, and guidance counselors feeling comfortable to reflect or decrease conflict, we turn to whom to handle issues in our classroom? Law enforcement. So because unconsciously, that was the right thing to do because we put all these people in the same conversation in order to protect our babies. President Clinton did the same thing with community-oriented policing. He said the answer to crime would be Flood our communities with more law enforcement officers, right? Because we want to go back to where law enforcement officers were grabbing cats out of trees, walking up to nice old ladies' homes and delivering the milk that's been sitting on the porch for an hour. When we started law enforcement, right, the conversation was around if you work an eight hour shift and you had zero arrests that day, guess what your supervisor said? You get a great 
job. You work an eight hour shift now, you don't arrest anybody, you're a state trooper, you don't write one speeding ticket, guess what your supervisor said? This might not be for you. <laughs> it's amazing these things that we every day are engaged in that contribute to our youth, contribute to our identity. We unconsciously have lost our accountability and making sure that everyone is accountable. I want us all to be accountable. So we got to have some conversation today around four constructs that I use in all of my life. Everything that I do, I appreciate the nice words that you said. These four constructs, if you could choose one of the uh, leave behinds on your desk, you can turn them over, please. These four constructs are identity, culture, diversity, and respect. And I've been using these in training law enforcement officers on implicit bias, partnering with local governments to think differently about what their city looks like around crime, education, unemployment, and poverty. Mm -hmm. I've been having these conversations now for over 20 years, right? And the identity conversation is how one sees his or herself as a unique person. But also, remember I said two forms of education, but also how society sees them. And sometimes those identities can be based in bias, stereotypes, and labels. Some of those three are good and some of those are bad. The issue with us not understanding that there needs to be two conversations around every conversation, every subject, is that we may mislead some people in thinking that certain identities are going to be received and accepted in the world. For example, right now we are having an issue with suicide with babies. 12, 13 years. Fastest growing suicide rate. Can anybody in the room tell me why? Social media, cyberbullying. Good. All the stuff the media tells us. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Now, because we refuse to tell them that if you internally feel that you were born with one gender identity and you are trying to mask yourself in a world that isn't accepted of physically looking one way but feeling different. When you internalize the no consequences to that, those kids are going home not feeling worthy of life. I'm not that tough. I'm not that tough to tell someone that you have to look and think like me or you don't deserve to be in this earth. For some reason, the identity, why would I even attempt to take away from you what you see every day in the mirror? We keep pushing these terms in the social science world and political world called colorblind. Post-racial society. What y'all see right now? When it comes to color, what do you see? Black. What is wrong with seeing what you see? It is not racism for acknowledging one's race. It's racism when you use it against them. I love my mama. I love my grandma. Y'all don't want me to love what I see in the mirror every day? You rather me not like myself, which means if I don't like myself, how can I even attempt to like you. So we cultivate each other into this hypocrisy of making you feel comfortable about who you are. I don't know how much education I've been in school for 22 years, and I've been in a lot of spaces where I've been the only one. And I mean the only one that looks like me, that thinks like me, the only one that has the education that I do. How much time do you want me to spend trying to figure out how to make you okay with me? Can you self-reflect on why you are bothered by my presence? 
Why would a 10-year-old kid that's identifying themselves as something different than what you think they should be? Why does that bother you? Why would you ask a kid to own that and cry and not like themselves? I love you and I wouldn't ask you to change who you are, what you look like, to make you feel comfortable. My ego is not that large. We have to take a different approach when we're thinking about the value of what identity is to that individual. And I mean parents, we have to hold some accountability of what you share with your children before they leave home. Hey Chad, if you grow your hair like that and you from Columbia, South Carolina, you might not be able to get a job. <laughs> what you mean? I thought it was supposed to be about what's in my head. That's what y'all told me. You told me if I go to school and you get an education that I'd be all right. And nobody come train me on no job interview skills about my hair. My wife of college came down to recruit me in PC and Citadel and East PSU. You think they were focusing on my hair? Who's gonna tell that kid those honest conversations? Because that bias that we're talking about that's implicit, it becomes whether or not you live in a different zip code. I thought I was supposed to get a master's in sociology, a master's certificate in alcohol and drug studies, a master's in criminal justice, a PhD in criminology. I thought I could go save the world. So you mean to tell me after all that, the way I wear my hair is going to prevent me from teaching your kids? What do you want me to do? I wonder what the kids we all looked alike, wore our hair alike, dressed alike, talked alike. Oh my gosh. When it gets to the point where we can sit down and go to lunch with somebody else and appreciate it, I know nothing about what it's like to be you, but I sure am willing to learn. Because when I teach kids about a toolbox, right? <laughs> we have a toolbox of life, and none of my lab is there. A carpenter doesn't need a hammer for every job. Does he or she? Now why can't we have a toolbox for life? Why don't you want to know what it's like when you're wearing my hair when I walk into the room and I feel good about it? I want to know what it's like to be you. Because we're going to live together as neighbors. We're going to work together as colleagues. I am a nerd for information. But for some reason, when we get cultivated to think, we get a couple letters, we get a couple dollars, I know everything. And they tell you that when you get a PhD. I love my advisors. As I was writing my thesis philosophy, my pedagogy, I said, I can't wait to get in front of students because this exchange of information is going to benefit everybody and I get to learn from you. You know what she told me? Take that out. Take a different route. She said, take that part out about learning from students. I said, why would I take that out? She said, because you got a PhD. Society says that you now know everything. You're an expert. Now, there's some confirmation bias, right? I don't know if I've been in this room if I wouldn't be a doctor, sorry. Especially with your pay. <laughs> <laughs> but somebody told me those honest conversations when I was on their journey and making a decision about my identity and how that could increase my self-esteem and I could love them. So I turned the head on his head. I said, they don't worry about what's on my head. And I'm going to be able to work I can get my hands on. So I don't get to walk in Walmart and someone assumes that I got, but 22 years of schooling and a PhD, and people actually invite me to come talk about issues that affect us all. That's where those <coughs> implicit biases come in that we all have. Oh my gosh, there's so much fun treating people. <laughs> I would walk past them all the time when I got my jeans on, my hoodie, and my Timberland boots. Mm -hmm. As soon as they stop and engage and open their mouth, I let y'all the socks loose. See, with my responsibility and accountability is to everyone that's in society. So I'm fortunate enough to represent some of those identities that we have alienated and marginalized for a long time. 
I'm also fortunate enough to get to the privileges that come with having this, this PI. Y'all got privileges, don't you? We all have privileges. Huh? What's the issue in the world with privilege? <clears throat> Why would I take away from you what you earn that comes with that that isn't going to hurt anyone? The problem with us in society is that we use privileges to get this advantage. I don't want to use my degree, sir. I don't want to sit in the room all the time and teach two classes a week and understand the National Institute of Justice, Department of Justice is putting out five million dollar grants to study communities that I got something to do to change the structure. It just it just wasn't okay for me to write a journal article or write a book chapter so I could increase my pay in the field. I wanted to get on the floor and do something that's gonna make a change. And I mean structural change. I mean generational change. I mean stand up in front of a 10-year-old kid that we know is suffering from it and say, man, I don't want to be like you. And I can say, no, you don't want to be like me. I want you to be like you. And I'm going to teach you how to get some of this stuff so you can love you and be like you. Stop telling y'all kids that role models on TV, please. Stop it. I don't know where Michael Jordan eat. I don't know Michael Jordan's value. You don't know where Dr. Stark is. Role models are cuss words in my home. If me or her mother didn't do the job for the person that she's looking up to, then I gotta look at me and say, I fail some kind of way. I'm not serving our babies up to this crazy world that we call society. We just talked about why these issues continue to persist. Why would I send a baby out there without being informed? If you don't hurt them now with this information and be honest with them, somebody's gonna hurt them soon. That's my responsibility. I'm working with this family when I first moved to Greenwood. And I'm hoping to work with this family, uh, the white couple. Oh, y'all know, like, white and black are okay words to use. <laughs> you know, black is no longer the bad eight ball, and the white is, there's no real white lies anymore. Y'all know that, right? <laughs> See how those semantics have been used to unconsciously create barriers and just separate. So this whole adoption, who's choosing to adopt brown, black babies and resources is so attractive to me, right? Because I need to understand the thinking of it. And as I was having a conversation in Greenville one day, this mother comes up to me and says, Dad, we just adopted this kid from Congo, Dr. Starks. He doesn't want him, we don't want him to lose his identity. But the best schools in Greenville County are predominantly white. How can we send a young black kid into a predominantly white educational environment and he or she does a really good identity? Oh, it's like, oh my God, that's like a softball. <laughs> <laughs> For some reason, we get uncomfortable with these conversations, and I'm like, at quality education, here's what we gotta think about. Edward Jones, and I've been reading about what inclusive environments mean to me. I want that kid to get the best education. Why wouldn't I want that young kid to go get what he or she deserves from a resource infrastructure? We got community organizations, we got work groups, we got churches, we can put our arms around that young man in the community to get that second form of education that I'm talking about, the informal piece. I went to one of the best colleges in the state of South Carolina. It was predominantly what? Look how many tunes that I received to be able to be comfortable standing up with people that don't look like me to have conversations. Tell that young man about who he is, where he's from, love himself, and also teach him about the environment that he will be in. Baby, you're gonna face some racism. I'm sorry. You're gonna face some racism. You're gonna face some words. You're gonna hear some things that might make you a little uncomfortable. I'm gonna need you to come home so we can talk about it to make sure that we address these issues and you don't need to blame yourself. When I talk to my kids that are in the Department of Juvenile Justice, they didn't go to first penitentiary because you were born. 
The Quakers did it in the 19th century earlier. And it wasn't full of black men doing any work. For some reason, having these conversations, we have lost our responsibility to be transparent. What I look like as an educate, educator or a parent lying to the youth. Stop. Tell them the reality of what society has for them and tell them that we can teach you how to navigate around it in order to love yourself, be accountable to give to others, and be successful at your craft. Culture is the second term, the second construct of animals. Heritage, tradition, style of dress, language, communication, music. I can't love that. I can't love the cookout that we have with the hundred and forty cousins I got from Tiny Girl Road. I can't love the fact that I might be the only one that went to get a formal education, but I still go with the back. I can't go share with them some of those cultural experiences that I've been appropriate because of my education and my professional career because they like hearing about what's black over there. You don't know what's over there until you've been over there. I said, I want to share with you what it's like. How exciting it is to learn. I heard the salsa music, and everyone got excited. How excited it is to learn about where that comes from, where it originates. Do you know there's over five million different cultures in the world? I was like, man, I got it out of the music. <laughs> Now there's some list of things that I want to do. I want to go to different places. I want to be able to, as a messenger, to go get some of those tools in my toolbox and come back and bring them back. I call myself a sponge of life, right? Water is information. You want to soak up as much knowledge and information so you can wing it out on others. I've been standing in front of judges, in front of pastors, in front of crack dealers, in front of crack users, in front of mamas, daddies, greens, rabbits, frogs. It doesn't matter what door, I gotta walk through it. You read studies in, in public school all the time about removing the good kids away from the bad kids or the bad kids away from the good kids. Y'all live in a society where that doesn't exist. Please tell me. Please tell me that unicorns are for real. <laughs> and what we don't share is that the research says that an inclusive and a diverse way of thinking, you need some of those kids in the classroom with your good kids. All that is about fear. You know crime doesn't happen there because the sex is right. It doesn't. I taught a course called Outside the Comfort Zone of the Classroom. A lot of my colloquial statements that I use is that we have to get uncomfortable to get comfortable. We have to get uncomfortable to get comfortable. And that information, that transparent conversation is what gets most of us uncomfortable. Then you can pour in information and education that will reduce the fear. Now I'm empowered because I know more. Now I'm empowered to be comfortable having an interaction and admitting that I don't know something. When you don't know it, build a relationship, trust, and rapport with each other and say, hey, how can we get more people of color involved with Eddie Jones? That is a fair question. That's an honest question. That's a high ethic of care. That's accountability in saying, well, I'm not going over there. You're just not on a whole lot of money. At the University of Delaware as a graduate student, we took University of Delaware students into the worst neighborhood defined by a social scientist in Wilmington, Delaware. I mean, drug infested, crime infested, everything that I'm teaching them in the book, we take them, we take them out in the community, right? We created a quadrant of where, where you should walk, walking in fours. Oh, y'all know to send white girls out into the hood, yeah, that's the two things, right? What's the two things? Drugs or oh wow, you tough. <laughs> <laughs> Drugs slash prostitution, but <laughs> oh, yeah, social workers that come in to save the day. 
<laughs> social wing, right? You know, that liberal art, come on, stop playing. Uh, <laughs> want to save the world. So we put yellow hats on our students, all of our students, so they could be identified differently. And what was that going to do to a community that has been given a lack of resources in education so they don't have to fear people that don't look like them? Because that's why they are afraid. Because we have cultivated them in thinking that we should trust her and all of her physical attributes. So we put yellow hats on our kids to do what? Yes, identify with that identity, but also to do what? Make them people comfortable. It's their home. It's their neighborhood. I'm going to teach a class and do a study. We're going to be gone. It's going to be another semester, and they still going to be living in them constructs that are just designed for you. Please respect where you go. Show some deference. Please respect where you go. But the other thing that we did is we understand that kids aren't damaged until they get around adults like us. At the end of the day, they just want to have fun. So I said, we should need sports, sidewalk chalk, basketball, jump rope. And why is that raised in none of them won't matter? It, it does not matter to that six-year-old kid. And guess what happened? Those kids started flocking around that gym coach at that middle school. Flocking around. Then they're going home and have conversations about what? About what? Students, Students that were enrolled where? Enrolled to an institution that was busing students past the university to the public school. Ain't nobody telling them they can bring them back home and make that shit that was there. Unconsciously, we contribute to this. That's where that word comes in and it's implicit because we've been cultivated to do it over and over and over. If you stop for a second, it's real simple. We can challenge those implicit bias and be conscious to remove the bias. I said, I guarantee you, those kids are going to like you because they feel that you care about them. Now we got kids saying, oh, you think I can go to college? <laughs> I just gave you the construct that told you theoretically influenced why a certain group of people participate in crime. If you can't eat and don't go to school, guess who's gonna get robbed? And we all know with a housing crisis that crime doesn't have the same identity as it used to when you need to eat. So why don't we treat it by saying, hey, I understand these barriers and think differently about how you address them? So most of us, right, when I decided to grab an H dollar, I did research on the program. Right? But most people would interview whom for the program? The community members, because they should be grateful that university students came into their homes, right? Their neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Guess who I interviewed? I interviewed the students. I want to see how it transformed your life. Because you're going to be the messengers of social justice with the jobs you take, with your career paths that you embark upon it. You're going to see them at Walmart again. Maybe I just created a new president. Maybe she was in that class. Maybe she's the next person that runs the Department of Justice. She can think differently about grant crimes that should be common to that community. I don't know. I felt like that was my responsibility. My first publication came from that work. Outside the comfort zone of the classroom. John was right. We're thinking differently about the same issues every day. Third, diversity, the cuss word of the world right now. Aren't we too smart where diversity only includes race and gender? Oh my God, y'all think I wake up every day. You think I'm tired of talking about this? I mean, I go into some rooms and they just, oh, here you come again. <laughs> you think I'm tired of it too? Sorry, Tommy. I know you're tired of it. <laughs> <laughs> Until something changes, I'm going to wipe my eyes, get myself up in the morning, and keep 
had in conversation. Y'all can't get tired. Until we get an equitable society, y'all don't have a right to get tired. Sorry, everyone. We got too many resources, too many education institutions in this country to insult each other by leaving and allowing race to be about race. I meant diversity to be about race and gender. My work challenges the individual that's going to get up to go in the community, to go in organizations, to go into corporations, to go into politics. It's an insult for us to leave the conversation of diversity around checking the box. We have enough. Can we have enough based on this physical identity? The best part about diversity is that you create the best qualified candidate. What do I mean by that? I'm the social director for Delaware State Grant, like you heard, where NASA gives out funds for undergraduate scholarships, summer research internships, and graduate fellowships nationwide. Every state has a pot of money to house at a higher education institution, to a community college, to a technical colleges, and there's also corporations like DuPont, right? So there's an education component, and then there's a workforce component, one of the greatest programs I've ever seen before, right? I'm working on a PhD at the University of Delaware, and I meet these two brothers, two white dudes that are brothers. <laughs> <laughs> And we create this bond over sports, and then we start going to eat together, you know, and then you find out they have more in common, and it's nothing but love. So they say, I want you to be my father. He's a physicist here at the University of Delaware. He likes me. So we meet, we start going to lunch, taking to Italian restaurants. I'm a poor graduate student, you know. When you go eat one time, that's breakfast, lunch, and dinner, whatever. Can I get a to go box, please? <laughs> So he started paying for these outings, and I'm learning and sharing, and he's comfortable, he's from South Philly. So he starts to bring up these research identities, and he tells me about this space grant program. And he says, Chad, we don't have an outreach component, and we don't have what underrepresented minorities. I said, what do you mean? I said, tell you, man, you got technical community to Delaware State Economy School. I got all these beautiful brown and black faces on campus. Hold on, wait a minute. You got resources that you can't get to the folks? I'm out here trying to get my cousin to stop studying crap. <laughs> no, seriously. I'm out here trying to get my cousins to stop studying crap. And they look at me and say, well, what you got for me in replace? You got a job? What you gonna do? Smart boy? What you got? Because we just need to eat. There's an institution with resources that needs to get it to marginalized groups. I love NASA for this. So based on the percentage of minorities in the state, there's a group of women, that a certain percentage of those funding sources have to go to underrepresented minorities. Mm. Go STEM world. That's a high standard, right? Delaware was about to be on probation because they couldn't do it. I begged them to let me go. They're like, you look at criminology, how are you gonna help us? I said, mm -hmm. There's that confirmation bias about what the S in science means. I said, think about it this way. You're in a different lab than me. You're a physicist, you're a chemist, biology, right? You're not trained on culture. You're not trained on institutional racism and the gist of why the population doesn't realize that a flyer that's advertised for space grant, they can actually earn the funding. I said, I guarantee you, y'all put up flyers in the hallway and y'all send our emails out. He's like, how did you know that? I said, because that's traditional way of the majority to advertise. Now you think those minority students that can't get bus, that's getting bus in the New York Delaware, you think their grandma and them told them to go to that school and apply for funds? What you think they told them? That's cultural competency. 
That's a level of expertise that I can't ask for a physicist to have because you have not taken those classes. Instead of thinking about it in an intimidation way, let's do an interdisciplinary approach. Let me bring my expertise to you, and you bring your expertise to me, and now we can talk about that. Diversity. Diversity at its best. So that, of course, they needed me to make them feel comfortable. So they invited me to the dog and pony show. Um, I put the hair up in a ponytail. It wasn't so overwhelming. <laughs> I put on my red and blue tie and I had on a blue suit that day. And before I left, I got seven emails of confirmation for me on the job. I joined in 2012 and we broke records for applications in a war year. I go speak to students in our seven school center and I associate about why they deserve these opportunities. And I address those histories of grandma, granddaddy telling you to be safe and not step outside your comfort zone. Four man panel, but I told you I have two conversations y'all not gonna have. And I train the faculty in the application of the field to think differently around cultural competency and religion. I said, if you're gonna want me to stand up in front of them, I'm gonna be honest with them. Don't use me to check your box if you need a picture of me for NASA Get Happy. And that really happened. When I sent a picture of them, NASA called them like within 10 minutes and said, I see you got one. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> Guess why I'm not offended? Because I know that's how the game is played. And I need to step in harm's way what people will say in order to benefit those students. I'm a bridge builder. I need to connect both worlds. That's what that toolbox gives me. It gives me the right to say, hey, I have an expertise to go get it. I can talk to you to come get it. It gives me an expertise to talk to you to say, you need to think differently about these kids. Because at the end of the day, you know we're not that tough, right? Like, we really want it to happen. We're just afraid that it's going to cost us something that we aren't comfortable with. So NASA invites me to come speak at national conferences. They gave me 10 million. <laughs> <laughs> then the next year they gave me 20. The next year they gave me four to five. The next year they gave me an hour. STEM recruitment and beyond, the messenger is the medium. That's the title of the article that just got accepted to the Journal of STEM Education. I don't know, but I might be the first criminologist and the publisher of STEM. <laughs> the self disclosure is about you self reflecting and knowing where you sit through your perceptual lens so you can be able to benefit the scientists that you have to create different ways of navigating and contributing a difference to society. That's what the self disclosure is about. And you have to be comfortable, and it's not easy. You're going to have to challenge structural policies. Diversity. Wapa College. First day, practice. I'm going to vacate somebody's job, right? I'm like, I'm going to question. I see this, what I call the idiot at the time, running into the wall during the kickoff, right? I was like, yo, this dude is crazy. We go to lunch that day. I walk up to him and I say this, I said, man, something wrong with you, you crazy. <laughs> He's like, freshman, who you think you're talking to? By this time, I had walked off because I, I didn't think my mother named me freshman. <laughs> so I didn't turn around. But the ego is big, right? I felt very comfortable doing it. Anyway, as I come back out, he says, sit down, I want to have a conversation with you. He said, now, why do you call me? I explained to him why I called him that. Two days later, we're in camp. I'm in the room at night, you know, cafeteria closed. And then there's an Arby's bag. My roommate said, hey man, the white dude brought you some food. I said, the white dude brought me some food. <laughs> man, put that in the trash. <laughs> <laughs> What's up? Go to practice that day, two a day, come back in the hallway that night. <laughs> Went to the top of the room, put it in another room. I come back, guess what's in the room? Arby's bag. All right, I gotta handle this dude now because it's something that's up with him. I go up to him the next day, man, what's your problem? So here's the fear, right? Man, 
man, if we know I'm in the daytime at 18 years, if we know that I wouldn't be here without the scholarship, if we know I ain't got no money to go nowhere and eat nothing at the cafeteria club, he bet not know that about me. He bet not know my vulnerability. I'll scare him. So I'm offended. I'm afraid that he just found out the truth about me. So guess who has to pay for my feelings? Someone that's loving me. Someone that understands the consequences of what it's like to go to a day football camp and be hungry at night. That's all. So when I walked up to him, I was like, man, there's something up. You, 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 what's up? What you buy this food? He starts laughing. He's like, I know you gotta be hungry at night just like everybody else does. He said, also, nobody has ever walked up to me the way you have. I've been in school here for two years and made me feel that comfortable. This gentleman appears to be white, but he's a Catholic. Guess what he teaches me? NASCAR. Dow Jones. Sit down. Let me bring my world to your world. I took my first trip to Boca Raton, Florida when I was 18 years old. That spring, I stayed a week with a friend Bray. Guess who became my stockbroker? A kid from Columbia, South Carolina, who ate out of in 18 years? No relationship with Pop or anything? There were no stockbrokers around the corner. <laughs> there were no financial investors in my world. He told me that $1 had just as much value as a thousand, which means he was just like, when I became an entrepreneur, he took 10 grand and turned it into 40. My daughter has zero student loans now. She has a master's in counseling. She's a guidance counselor at Somerville High School. He changed the way I thought about money. We are in positions right now where you can be game changers for a lot of communities, a lot of individuals, a lot of people that come from neighborhoods and environments. Like me. I've been fortunate to live in diverse places and think differently and have diversity for real. That had nothing to do with skin color, did it? It had to do with a different way of thinking and differences of the strengths. He brought what he did. He said, man, but what you're teaching me has nothing to do with money. His mother was from Italy, his dad was from Venezuela. So what do you think I taught him? I how to navigate this crazy country we live in. I learned how to carry with them and put it up in front of each other. He thinks that carries more weight than that forty thousand dollars he paid for me. Different way of thinking, different things are your strengths. I wasn't afraid to call him crazy and create the best friendship, one of the best friendships I have to this. I don't see why the people in the room aren't in the same position. The core values are there and you gotta get comfortable having some difficult conversations. I read up on it. These are difficult conversations sometimes, but the outcome, oh man, it creates so much self-esteem, so much positive self-identity. When you walk home knowing that you just gave someone an asset that could change, then what? Now, my daughter's expectations for her investment portfolio, her responsibilities to the community, her identity is totally different than mine was. And it's because someone that had an expertise like he had decided to teach me. Don't know what's over there until you go over there and get a relationship with someone from there. I know I can institute. I partner with University of Government to do an asset-based education and employment opportunity to disadvantaged communities. I use different terms whenever I interact with people that have been marginalized. That's why it's an asset space, and I'm pretty sure we all know assets. So I changed the language. You ever been around poor kids? You don't think they know they're poor? Yeah. Why do I need to remind them? Why do you use terms like disadvantaged? You could be disadvantaged. You can't control what neighborhood you live in. You can't control how much money mom or dad or grandma how much makes right now. So I'm going to bring a different empathy for your situation and I'm going to get you to think more positive. 
I talk to your surroundings right now. And then during this message, you have a <coughs> curriculum that I use based on these four constructs that increases the social emotional learning. My educators, educators are upset with me because we talk about achievement gaps. We don't use achievement gap language. We use lack of resources. If a kid doesn't love himself or herself, I don't think you can get them to read a book. It's very difficult walking in a room when you don't think people want you to be there. You think they're going to learn from you? It's very difficult walking in a room when you don't even have anything to eat that morning before you got there. So the sexy term for disadvantaged youth in this situation is a kid faced in Generation 2 poverty code. So we had 6% of all our kids in our school district receiving free or reduced lunch. That was the only criteria that I advertised in order to receive the application for my program. I asked them to do things that I understand that would be a challenge for them, right? Like, go get your grades, write a letter of interest. But none of the GPA requirements, why would I do that knowing that there are achieving, lack of achievement resources in our school system? Well, how you learn? Because I know grades are the only one identifier for being able to say I got an education. I said, I bet you these kids got some informal education that I can make them realize they can use in the classroom. I got a tool for that. I don't need partner up in this school. Partner in this university government, they gave me a van and a city employee that was a driver. Why did I need that? What's the number one barrier for poverty? Oh, we gave him a chance to get a job, but he can't get to work on time. Well, you know, he just came home with a felony, he don't have no driver's license and or a car. I don't need my ego to be so big when I understand that's a barrier. You have resources. Pay nine more dollars an hour for someone to work on Saturday. They go pick up my baby's food. So now they can't use that as an excuse, can they? What about food? Second barrier. Power of the dinner table. We sat down and we ate every morning together before I started doing instruction. Why? I had to earn that trust. You sit down at your dinner table. Think about the conversations you have with your loved one. But then what's going on this week in school? Or what happened today in school? Unconsciously, I was gaining their trust. I cared about what happened all week. Frito Lay partnered up with me, gave me a bunch of potato chips. I know it wasn't the healthiest thing. <laughs> <laughs> and so I gave it to go bags of food, sandwiches, pizza. I know when they met with Dr. Stark, they got two meals. That made me feel good. I address the barriers that we know that they are facing. Life skills. That's what course I had. Financial literacy. I partnered with the local community bank. Credit union. They came and did a three-hour session. I had 80% of your staff. Well, I'm going to be A lot of my family didn't even have bank accounts. So I made sure that they had to get the experience of walking in a bank and opening up a bank account. You should have seen the smile on those kids' faces when they came back to tell me about what it was like walking in a bank. It's awesome. Because you know it's there. They needed five bucks just to open the account. I, 80% goes into the checking account, 20% goes into the savings account. That was my rule with the bank. If you're going to partner with me, you need to teach them what it looks like when you get money and how to save so you don't live with it. Now, how long do you think that savings account lasts? Mm -hmm. I did say Generation 2 poverty too, right? So Uncle needed that debit card. Mama needed that money to help pay the rent. They needed to put food on the table. But it was my responsibility to introduce it to them. It was mine. I felt good about that. I took that responsibility on. 99% of my kids got jobs. Lynchburg City employees. They became government employees over the summer. They made some made eight, nine dollars an hour as a lifeguard. They got two hundred dollar scholarships to get to training. Y'all been to college, you know how much money you can make as a lifeguard while you're in college? We just set them on a different path of economic viability. Just did. If they work long enough, they, they, they can become employees, right? 
16 year olds, you're working the summer, parks and rec, maybe at 18 if you aren't ready for higher education, guess what you can walk into? Maybe you become a full time city employee for local government. Maybe you get health benefits now. Maybe you get to meet some of the new intelligent people that talk about what financial does in the first place. There's a population I think we're missing out on. There's a population that I think we're missing out on. I don't know what portfolios are, but I know what assets are. And I know these phases are solutions to the problems that we've been talking about for a very long time. The last one is respect. How you see yourself and others in high regard. You should have had a picture of it, but mine constructs overlap each other for a purpose, and the definition is the word previously written in each other, except for respect. Because I say if you understand identity, understand culture, understand diversity, then guess what comes organically? A difference. So that way you don't have to go have an initiative to get women involved. You don't have to go have an initiative to say we need more people of color. Because your consciousness is already thinking about difference from the first three constructs. So we can move past this and Dr. Starr can talk himself out of a career and be somewhere else doing something else. I just want you to work me, with me a little bit around the self-reflection. What have I been getting? Right? And I need space every day. So real life application, ethic of care. Hardest thing to do in society is the what? Is to care. Because once you care about something, you got to change your pronoun. It's no longer about I or me. You're going to think about those, they, them first. It's hard for me to care. I don't mean care saying, yeah, having one conversation. I mean taking your skills and putting yourself in a position to change the structure that we want to change to create that. I need you. I need you all to be messengers of social justice. As good or bad as we think I am, I can't be in every place. I need you at home, changing your conversations with your spouse, with your partner, with your uncles, with your aunts, with your kids. That's what those leave behinds are. My work is to create messengers of social justice. I need you to do it when you go back to your respective environments today. It's nice to have these conversations, but we don't want a cosmopolitan canopy, right? We don't want to get all excited in the room. Yeah, I'm feeling the speaker. It was great. And then when we walk out, we, we walk right back into our heads. I'm asking you to join me on this journey. Let's change the way we think about it. Let's change the way we interact with each other. Let's be bridge builders together to create a more loving society. Before I go, I want you to hold up the lead behind that you chose. Now that we have these conversations around bias and implicit bias, I want you to consciously think about why you chose the one you did. Did that one make you feel like you? Did that one make you more comfortable? Did that one gender? Was it race? Or did you just grab the one that was closest to your seat? <laughs> Thank you all for letting me share. I really do appreciate it. Hopefully I've given it. Show my gratitude, my purpose of being here, and um, the appreciation of giving me a microphone and giving me a platform to come share something that is very important to me called life. Thank you.